Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. I've always found the subject of statistic management to be fascinating. Not so much the graphing and the keeping of the statistics, which is obviously important because without well-kept and accessible statistics, you're not going to have much statistic management going on. But what I've always found fascinating is the what it means if a stat is going up or down a certain way and what to do about it or you know, comparing statistics. you know, For instance, if I have a new patient problem, I'm looking at the number of responses I'm getting to the number of conversions. Is my problem promotion or is my problem reception? And so on. So with the proper knowledge, statistics are like the instrument panel in your car, you know, your fuel gauge, your tachometer, your oil pressure gauge, etc. They give you insight into what is actually happening with it. For that matter, trying to manage your business without statistics, regular use of statistics, is sort of like driving your car with your instrument panel in your trunk. You know, am I out of gas or low on fuel? I don't know. Is my oil pressure too high? Who knows? Is the car about to overeat? Maybe. You would never find out until it's too late. You've run out of gas or you see smoke coming out from under your hood. And being that this is not an automotive podcast, let me compare this to dentistry. You wouldn't consider treating a patient without a proper diagnosis. And that would include whatever diagnostic tests and an examination and so on in order to find out what's actually going on. Even if it's a limited exam with a, a PA for a particular tooth, you wouldn't just jump in and treat. You'd get x-rays, you'd get charting, you'd do an exam, you'd do perioprobing, etc. Well, just like you use these things with a patient to determine what's happening and what should I do, statistics are used for an organization. So yeah, there's a lot to know about the subject of stats, especially the handlings you should be doing based upon what is happening with your stats. But that said, what if you have a statistic representing an area of your practice? Maybe you're graphing it so you can see if the graph is going up or down. And the statistic is just bad or it's continuously declining despite the fact that you're doing everything possible to fix it. You've thrown everything at this thing. Let's say it's production. Your production is just terrible, but your staff are calling. They're sending texts. They're sending letters. You're calling the incomplete treatment list and so on. You're trying everything you've done in the past to turn it around, and nothing is working. It just keeps going down. Well, if this describes any area of your practice, whether it's production, collection, new patients, and so on, you, my friend, have what we call a sticky graph. The graph is stuck on a downward trajectory or it's just in a horrible, horrible low range that doesn't work for your practice and it will not change. And the handling for a sticky graph is a specialized situation and that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode. We're going to look at what a sticky graph is exactly, how do you define it, what causes it, and what to do about it. My name is Jeff Bloomberg and I'm your host. And look, I know it's fun to talk about when things are going well and everything's fun, but the sticky graph situation, while not all that pleasant, if perpetuated, can be the ruin of a business, especially if it's an income-related statistic. If your collections just keep going down and down and down and it's not enough to pay your bills, what's the eventual outcome of that? There's only so much debt you can take on to sort of bail yourself out. Eventually, you just have to call it quits. So, If you have a situation like this, this is something that you want to confront and handle. Now, if you're familiar with MGE, you know that we use the Hubbard management system developed by L. Ron Hubbard. And Mr. Hubbard's works on management consist of literally millions of words and cover just about any aspect of management and organization you can conceive of from HR to financial planning to increasing efficiency and statistic management and beyond. It's quite a bit. And I say this because the information I'll be sharing with you today comes from the Hubbard Management System, and we cover it in our seminar here at MGE on statistic management, this this subject of a sticky graph. So how does Mr. Hubbard define a sticky graph? Well, let's have a look. Here's what he says, and this is from an article he wrote, and there's a subhead that says sticky graphs, and this is what he says. Bad graphs, and let me just stop there for a second. When we say graph, we're talking about a statistic graph. So let's say you're statistically representing with a line your collections. And it's just, in this case, he's saying a bad graph. It's not good. So here's what he says. Sorry about that. Bad graphs, which resist all efforts to improve them, are made. And that's in italics. Bad graphs, which resist all efforts to improve them, are made. 
They don't just happen. A sticky graph is one that won't rise no matter what one does. So let's say your new patients are just going down, 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 and you don't know quite what to do about it, but you're trying everything that you've done in the past to get more new patients. You're asking for referrals. You've upped your Google pay-per-click budget and your Facebook budget. You've made sure your new patient blocks aren't being abused. They're being left open for new patients, right? And no matter what you're doing, everything you've done before, or maybe you're trying new things even, nothing seems to improve this graph. It's still bad or it's going down. And I guess that's one of the key things here. If my new patients are bad and I'm just not doing anything about it, you know, well, I'm just, other than feeling bad about it, I just think they're, they're bad. Uh, well, then that's not necessarily a sticky graph because if I were to start doing something about it, I might see some improvement. Again, as he says here, just to reference what I just read, a sticky graph is one that won't rise no matter what one does. So that does have an assumption here that you're doing something about it. So new patients, you're trying everything. It is not improving. You have a sticky graph now. So now what causes a sticky graph? He says it's made, right? Well, let's hear, here's what he says about this. Such a graph is made. It is not a matter of omission. It is a matter of action. If one is putting heavy effort into pushing a graph up and it won't go up, then there must be, this is the key part, folks. I'm injecting that there. He says, there must be a hidden counter effort to keep it down. I'm going to read that paragraph again because I want this to just bury this in your brain. This is something I've remembered for years and years and years as an executive, sort of burned into my brain, maybe not buried, burned. It's something that I can reference anytime I'm having a real hard time with an area. I'll read this again. If one is putting heavy effort into pushing a graph up and it won't go up, then there must be a hidden counter effort to keep it down. So let's take a look at this effort and counter effort as he's referencing there for a second. So what would be effort? If I'm trying to fill the schedule, I'd be making phone calls. I'd be sending texts. I'd be sending emails. I'd be sending letters, right? I'm trying to fill the schedule. Let's say hygiene's falling apart. There's nobody in the hygiene schedule. What would be an example of effort? It's those things. Calls, out, you know, outgoing communication. The hygienist is seeing if we can keep a patient maybe for the next quad of scaling and route planning. We're doing everything we can to fill this schedule, okay? That's effort. Now, he references in that quote a second ago, heavy effort. So you're really, really working at this, right? So what are you running into? Again, he says there must be a hidden counter effort. Well, what's counter mean? Counter means against. So you have effort and counter effort. If let's say I had this, uh, you know, a, a chair with wheels on it and you're on one side and I'm on the other side and I'm trying to push this chair to the wall. All right, the chair's in the middle of the room. I'm wheeling this chair to the to the wall. Maybe not the best example, folks, but I think you can work with me on this. I'm going to push it to the wall, but you're standing on the other side. So I'm pushing it in one direction and you're pushing directly against me. That's counter effort. So if you were to stop pushing, it would be very easy for me to wiggle the chair to the wall. But meanwhile, I'm sweating. I'm pushing this chair. I'm just trying to get this because you're resisting me very heavily to get this to the wall. But now keep in mind, he says it's a hidden counter effort. Now, I know that you're going to have to work with me on this example here, but what if I can't see you? For whatever reason, I'm pushing, and I don't know what's pushing back so hard. So I'm pushing harder, and I'm pushing harder, and I'm pushing harder. I mean, of course, that might get a little weird, I'm using a little bit of a weird example here, but that's essentially what you're looking at. You're pushing real hard to achieve a certain objective, and something is pushing back. You're getting counter effort, and it is hidden. You cannot see it. Now, to bring this home a little bit, you know, the one thing that, that the one advantage to having been in the industry for you know approximately thirty years, actually a little bit more now, is I've got lots of examples. I've seen stuff like this. I don't know if I've mentioned before in the podcast, but I've been in close to a thousand dental practices across the United States over the last you know however many decades. And I remember walking into one office in particular. It was in a strip mall. It was a nice office, and the doctor had called me in for a practice evaluation to you know tell him what was wrong with his office. And I'm sitting in reception. 
And his receptionist or whoever his front desk person was didn't really know why I was there. She just knew that I was on the schedule to meet with the doctor. So I'm sitting in reception. For all she knew, I was selling something or I was a supply rep or whomever. And I watch a walk-in patient come in because this was a busy strip mall. Patient comes in and it's a walk-in and asks her, how much do you folks charge for a crown? Now, look, and it's a shopper. You might think this is bad, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a potential opportunity. I've talked about this before. But anyway, so she comes in. I'm sorry, rather, the patient comes in and asks her, how much does his office charge for the crown? Her response was, well, they're very expensive here. You might want to go somewhere else. So think about that for a second. This doctor is already having a hard time, which is why I'm being called in. I'm not being called in because his office is doing so great. He's got problems. He has a walk-in patient, a prospective new patient who asks how much crowns cost. And the way reception handles this is tells this patient that they're very expensive there. They should go elsewhere. I've seen cases where you know we can't figure out why the new patients are down and then you find out the receptionist is hanging up the phone when you call the office, okay, or they're putting people on excessive amounts of hold intentionally. I've seen cases where people fake, you may have seen this in your office, allegedly confirm patients when they didn't confirm patient or they schedule three patients at the same time. In some cases, intentionally, where they're just lying or they don't want to tell the doctor what's actually going on or a treatment coordinator telling the doctor that, well, yes, yeah, sorry, we've applied for all this financing and nobody's getting approved. And then when the office manager really digs in, finds out that they didn't apply for financing. You see, like false report type stuff. I'm not talking about that the treatment coordinator didn't have the skill set to close the patient, but really not giving a clear picture of what the scene is, and it makes the scene seem to be worse than it actually is. Probably one of the most egregious cases I ever saw, which I've talked about in seminars before. I don't know if I've ever spoken about it on the podcast. We had a client from South Florida, and uh, she came in, dentist. We were a small office. She was doing twenty twenty five thousand a month. This was years ago, and she comes to our communication and sales seminars. Which you know we have three seminars train, that train people on how to properly present and get acceptance for a treatment. And the average increase up from these seminars for you know the average person coming in is three hundred thousand in year one, two hundred eighty eight thousand to be exact. And it's the third seminar she's been to, and we still see no improvement. So we're trying to figure out what is going on here. This makes no sense. So she meets with, um, I believe it was Sabri, who you've, you've seen on the, or heard rather on the podcast before. She meets with Sabri and her husband. Her husband didn't work in the practice, but you know he was up here to support her. And uh, she starts, Sabri starts asking questions about what's going on in the practice. The first thing that was weird was Sabri notices that this doctor can't fill from 4 to 6 p.m. on her schedule. She's open two or three days a week till 6 p.m. So from 4 p.m., to 6 p.m. is always empty. Now, let that ring in your brain for a second because if you're the average office which has no control over your schedule, 4 to 6 p.m. should be booked out weeks in advance. Now, the office wasn't very busy to begin with, but 4 to 6 p.m. is just strangely empty. So Sabri talks to the doc and her husband for a little bit, and they cook up a little plan just to figure out, you know, like a little bit of a mystery call. This was years ago. So they decide that the doctor's friend, because the office is open till 6 is going to call the practice as a new patient, pretending to be a new patient, and try to schedule an appointment for after four. So the doctor's – was actually the doctor's husband's friend rather. So he has his friend call the practice and talk to the receptionist. And the receptionist you know, says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a new patient. I'm going to schedule an appointment for after four to get my teeth clean, blah, blah, blah. And the receptionist tells him, I'm sorry. We don't see any patients after 4 p.m. So remember, this office is open until 6 the receptionist says to this prospective patients, I'm sorry, we don't take any patients after four. Now, what was happening on the inside between this front desk slash prospective office manager and the doctor? The doctor's trying to figure out why her schedule is so empty. She has no idea. She's talking to this person at her front desk. You know, what's going on? Well, doctor, I'm calling everybody. Nobody seems to want to schedule. Look, I'm really trying. I'm in your corner. I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest supporter. I just don't understand. People think the dentist is too expensive. This is what the doctor is hearing. So the doctor is becoming, you know, going into despair about her business. Meanwhile, the person answering the phone is blowing patients off after 4 p.m. So the doctor had no clue this was what was causing her problems. This was a hidden counter effort. So obviously, this was pretty egregious. So the doctor let this employee go. And what happened? She brought in a temp employee initially. She eventually got a good office manager. 
and her statistics doubled almost overnight. Why? Because the person who was shutting the front door covertly in a hidden manner was no longer there. The person now was a temp. The new person was a temp and they knew that their job was to schedule patients. It wasn't rocket science. It was very easy. It's just you got out what the pushback was and all of a sudden the stats started to respond. So essentially what you've got here with this sticky graph, which is what this doctor had, is you have someone not doing what they are allegedly doing or supposed to be doing, and but they're not doing nothing. Remember, he, Mr. Hubbard mentions earlier in that first quote I read, this is, it is not a matter of omission. It is a matter of action. Well, in this case, this person was intentionally blowing prospective patients off. All right? So normally we give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, they're a new person. They don't know what they're doing, blah, 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 blah. You know, this is going to be a different, different scene if I have a new person, let's say, doing scheduling versus somebody who's giving me hidden counter effort. Like one is going to be just a scene that's just never improving. Whereas if I have a new person, they're just going to be making mistakes. But generally, if they're employable, they're a decent prospective employee, I should start to see some improvement after a short period of time. So when things are bad, how do you find this hidden counter effort? You know, what, what, what illuminates it? Well, here's what Mr. Hubbard says. He says, you can normally find this counter effort by locating your biggest area of noncompliance with orders. That person is working hard to keep graphs down. In this case, it isn't laziness that's at fault. It's counter action. So again, I've got a bad generalized scene. And you know, when a scene's bad, production's down, collections down, new patients are down, it's very hard to figure out, you know, where is this coming from? What, what is going on? And this is again, remember, assumes that you're trying to do something to remedy this. You're not just sitting there watching your office go up like looking like a dumpster fire while you're not doing anything. You're doing something, but there's no improvement, right? So it just seems like generally bad. So in that case, it's e- easy to generalize and blame all kinds of things. It's the insurance company. People aren't working hard. Patients don't want to schedule. Patients don't want to pay, et cetera. So we want to find out. Uh, we want to find this hidden counter effort. So let's say I'm having trouble with um, scheduling and I have a couple people who work on scheduling. Obviously, if I have one person who works on scheduling, they most likely are my problem. If I have a person who's charged of the schedule and the schedule's bad, that person's probably the problem. Uh, if I'm having trouble locating this, as he says here, I'm going to look for my biggest area of noncompliance with orders. So how can I do that? Because most people think of noncompliance in a very limited view, meaning I ask somebody to do something and they just tell me no, like straight noncompliance, right? Or you've, you've given a patient oral hygiene instructions, or you've given a patient instructions on exactly what they have to do to care for their socket after an extraction, or they just had a bone graft and you've given them home care instructions or something like this, and they just don't do it. Okay, so that, that's a pretty obvious form of noncompliance. Or you ask your uh, schedule coordinator or your receptionist to confirm tomorrow's patients and they just say no. That's obvious noncompliance, but that's usually what people limit noncompliance to. Noncompliance is a bit of a bigger deal. It's actually a lot simpler than you think. If I ask somebody to do something, assuming I am their you know, boss and I ask them to do something, ideally that is within their scope of their job. You know, I'm not going to go to my schedule coordinator and say, hey, can you file insurance unless I, you know, that's, their, that's not their job. If there's a schedule coordinator, that just makes me a bad executive and I'm causing confusion in my organization. But assuming I'm asking somebody to do something, uh, that's within their you know, purview per se, and they just don't do it. That is noncompliance. doesn't matter why they didn't do it. Oh, I'm really busy. Or they just didn't do it and I ask them, hey, did you do that? And they go, oh, yeah, I forgot or no, I didn't. That's not blatant, nasty, you know, I'm not doing this. It's not that. They just didn't do it. That is noncompliance. So if I have a schedule coordinator and I say, hey, listen, I need to fill from 4 to 6 p.m. on the schedule. I want it filled, you know, two days from now. I need that schedule filled. There are patients to call. And they don't do it. That is noncompliance. You might go, well, but Jeff, they may call patients and patients don't want to take those appointments. Well, why do why do they exist then? Why do I have them on my job? Otherwise, I could just have nobody and still have it empty. That's why I hired them. They're supposed to fill the schedule. I have thousands of patients to call. I'm sure they can find somebody to come in to see me. You see? So it's, it's 
does it happen or does it not happen? And it does not have to be openly uh, egregious or nasty or belligerent for it to constitute noncompliance. It's just did it not get done? Assuming that what I'm asking them to do is within their job and it's you know something that I would see to be as reasonable to be done. You know, if I have a treatment coordinator and I say, listen, um, we don't have a lot of consults on the schedule right now and production next week looks pretty bad. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to call the incomplete treatment list. I need you to call anybody who is not due for recall that's on the incomplete treatment list and schedule them during the doctor's consult time for a uh, quick check to make sure everything's staying stable so the doctor has another opportunity to sell them. And then once you've called all those people, I want you to call everybody who's overdue for their cleaning and schedule them for cleanings. And I want to at least get 20 cleanings scheduled by the day after tomorrow. Okay. And let's say you're the office manager issuing this order and you're trying to revert a scene that's not going very well. And you as the office manager know, number one, what you ask them to do is reasonable, meaning you could do that. All right. If I'm, if I, I, if I look at something and I go, well, yeah, I could schedule 20 people over the next two days. Well, then I am completely comfortable without really even breaking a sweat, completely comfortable asking somebody to do the same, especially when that's their full time job. All right. Uh, but if, uh, I'm not, let's say I, I, let's say I, I think I could do 20 and I ask somebody to do 60. Well, then that's a little unreal and ridiculous at that point. And of course, you're going to end up disappointed. So let's say two days go by. And I ask, uh, did you call the incomplete treatment list? Oh, no, I got busy and forgot. Okay, well, number one, there could be some validity to that. What if all of a sudden a ton of new patients called in, emergency patients or whatever, and the treatment coordinator was locked down doing presentations with the doctor for six hours a day, in which case the stats would look good right now. Uh, and I would, you know, that, that would be reasonable. They didn't have time to make those phone calls because they were sitting across from a perspective, you know, with, with a, with a patient for most of the last two days. Okay, fine. But let's say they didn't. Well, what were you busy doing? Oh, I just had this going on and this patient called this, that, the other. That is non-compliance. So I have a bad scene because I'm not going to, you know, like th take that example I gave you a minute ago with that doctor couldn't fill from four to six and their practice wasn't growing. It was actually in a, in a really unviable, meaning it wasn't capable of sustaining itself long-term financially condition. Well, I would have respected that staff member more if they told the doc, you know, doc, uh, you know, I don't really schedule any patients after four because, you know, A, I don't like you or well, for whatever reason she was doing it or B, I want to go home and watch Dr. Phil or I don't know why she was doing it, but for whatever reason, I would respect that more because at least it would illuminate what was actually going on. So most people won't do that. They won't go, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I've been blowing you off or I'm, I'm you know, looking at TikTok videos all day or I'm talking to my friends on the phone or I've been making other calls to other practices to see if I could get a better job. They're not going to tell you this stuff because you know that's going to cause upset. So they're going to tell you something else. But really, that's why you have the statistic. The statistic isn't improving. The statistic isn't changing. Well, all right, that's your tell. And then you're giving them things to do that are rational, reasonable things to do uh, that you would are, you would think are completely accomplishable and they're not accomplishing them, whether they're outright refusing, assuming what you're ordering them to do is within their job or they're busy or they forgot or this or that or whatever, but they're still non-complying, that person is a problem. So what is the handling for this? So let's say you've located this. You have this problem. This person is non-complying. They're your largest, as, as Mr. Hubbard says, they are your uh, biggest area of non-compliance with orders. And you want to resolve this situation. So what does he say to do? Let's have a look. I, here's what he says. I've never seen an organization or a division or a section. I'll interject here. He's uh, or a division or a section or parts of an organization. Okay, I'll continue with what he says here. So I've never seen a, an organization, a division, or a section that had a sticky graph that was not actively pushing the graph down. Such areas are not idle. They are not doing their jobs. They are always doing something else. And he puts that in italics. And that something else may suddenly hit you in the teeth. So beware of a sticky graph. Find the area of noncompliance and reorganize the personnel or you as an executive will soon be in real hot water from that quarter. Those things which suddenly reared up out of your in-basket, and I'll interject your in-basket, you know, where, where your incoming communication comes, maybe on your desk, right? I'll read this again. Those things which suddenly reared up out of your in-basket, all claws, 
happened after a long period of sticky graphs in that area. Today's grief was visible months ago on your statistics. So Mr. Hubbard gives you the handling right there. He says, find the area of noncompliance and reorganize the personnel. So what might that look like? You might have to replace some people. Let's say you have a schedule coordinator and you go, okay, uh, I want to run my schedule a certain way. Maybe you've run your schedule for years this way. You do primary procedures in the morning and your deliveries in the afternoon and implants are on this day and consults are at these times. You, you have a schedule and you, there's order in your schedule. Then you uh, hire a new person because this person is leaving the practice. They're retiring or they're leaving town. So you bring somebody else in. And all of a sudden, the schedule starts to go haywire. So you talk to this person, you train this person, you talk to this person, you train this person. And then they start to give you reasons why it just doesn't work anymore. Well, you know, people don't want to do that anymore. You know, young people don't like this. Things have changed. People don't like having to come in and miss work. Like you're hearing all types of things that you never heard before with your prior scheduler. Whether you had a system before or you're just trying this for the first time now, okay? But – you're hearing how this won't work and what you're asking them to do doesn't seem out of the ordinary. As a matter of, but matter of fact, all your friends do it. They have order in their schedules, but you for some reason can't because your scheduler is telling you how it's basically impossible. The only place you could go wrong would be to go, oh, you know, he or she must be right. I guess this just is impossible. Toss the whole thing, become apathetic about it and just do whatever. Then you don't keep control of your practice, all right? You've bought the line, okay, that it's not possible to do, and now you've agreed with it. I would not agree with something like that. If I'm asking – what I'm asking the person to do is reasonable and rational, and they just can't do it despite any training or whatever, then I'm going to get somebody who can. I've had that experience numerous times. You may have as well. Because when someone is ineffective, of course most people are going to justify their ineffectiveness because they don't want to be looked at as ineffective and wrong. Maybe they want their job. Maybe they only want their job till they can find a better one. It really doesn't matter. But I'm going to get somebody who can't – assuming what I'm asking them to do is real and it's rational, then I'm going to expect them to do it. And if they just – despite any training, help, effort, you know, what I'm trying to do for them to get them to be able to do it, they won't do it. I'm going to get somebody who can. All right? So I'm not going to buy into this. Uh, you know, I'm not going to take on their, – their, I'm not going to agree with what they're saying. I'm going to get somebody else who actually can do it. Now, you might have a situation where you don't have to get rid of the personnel. It might be a true reorganization. Let's say you have somebody who was a great dental assistant and you make them a treatment coordinator and they're just really bad at it. And you try and they're just not doing well and they're justifying effectiveness or whatever – your ineffectiveness or whatever. You might just move them back to being a dental assistant again and get somebody else who can be a treatment coordinator. So there are possibilities where you don't lose the personnel and you just reorganize. I mean to be real and this is just me talking here from what I've seen. Usually when I have a sticky graph scene where someone is actively resisting or, or giving me counter effort to improving an area – they probably don't belong in my business. They're probably not a good fit for my business at that point because the least I would expect, you know, if if we're all kind of contributing, we've all got our, our shoulder to the wheel contributing to the motion organizationally and we're all going in the same direction. If I've got somebody going exactly the opposite of the way I'm going and that's okay with them, well, they're probably just not a good fit. They should go somewhere else. That's usually how this ends up. I have seen cases of organization where it's worked. But it really depends on you know, what your facilities are as far as your ability to handle and take care of your personnel. In most offices, you really don't have the ability to sit and get this personnel productive again. You just got to move on and find somebody else. That's something that's between you and your uh, you know, manager and your employment attorney and everybody else. But I, I would have a hard time keeping somebody who was actively against anything I was trying to do organizationally, assuming what I was asking to do wasn't stupid or bad. All right? So – that's the data on the sticky graph, right? It's not fun to deal with, but it's something where you got to put on your big boy or big girl pants and confront problem staff or problem situations. You know, you don't just owe it to yourself because, you know, you look at it, you have a limited practice window. If you own a practice, you have a certain length of time where you're going to be most effective. And every month, year, et cetera, that goes by, we are not really doing all you can is a year loss that you're never going to gain back. So you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your family. You also owe it to the rest of your team because if I'm in a situation where I'm working in your business and I've got a coworker who's tanking everything, well, that affects me too. So it's, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the rest of your team as well. 
and their careers. You owe it to everybody to not allow something like this to continue. So there you have it. Uh, that's what you what a sticky graph is and what you do about it. Here's to hoping you don't have one or that if you do, that you don't wait forever to handle it. And if you want to learn more about this or stat management or organization or efficiency or any of these subjects, this is what we teach our clients on the MGE Power Program. I'll put a link to it as well as the uh, ABC seminars I talked about earlier uh, on the episode webpage. Because when you're trained on these things, you can actually do something about about them effectively. And it, the, the beautiful thing about training is it's not just something that we tell you to do and you do it once and then you have to call us every time in order to figure out what to do. Um, you, you're trained. That's something that you know for life and can apply again and again and again. So I hope this helps. That's all I have for you folks this week. Um, if you want to find out more about MGE, you can contact us at 800-640-1140 or find us online at mgeonline.com. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you at the next episode.